And after the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament has a much more involved role in dealing with all the trade issues, and we have um, discussions about investment protection policy. And that, I believe, is also very important, that it's in this House which works in an open and transparent manner that these discussions take place and where the public stakeholders can also have a say in that. Last year in April, we, we in the Parliament passed a resolution on the future of European international investment policy. And it was quite a general text and um, we were looking at the policies, different aspects for from investor protection to protecting the right to regulate, inclusion of sustainability criteria, dispute settlement, and many other items. Why did the treaty makers in Lisbon decide to shift the competence? If you look at the travaux preparatoire, uh, you won't find much. Second, um, I believe uh, there was a feeling in the convention at large we should strengthen the EU power in the world. And that also means uh, that we should unite forces because if we punch together, we achieve more. Ladies and gentlemen, my third point, how have we now exercised our competence uh, um, in the last two years? A lot has been done. I really have to say this. We are currently negotiating investment chapters in three FDAs, Canada, quite difficult, Singapore, also not easy, and India. And on all these matters, uh, important questions of policy making come up. Our general line is we want to achieve so-called gold standards, meaning what member states have done previously with this very same third country should be our yardstick. The European Union is the biggest exporter of foreign direct investments worldwide. It has the largest experience. Frank Hofmeister already has recalled we have 1,300 investment protection treaties in the European Union which had been uh, negotiated and concluded in the past where we can rely, rely on. And the European Union, as he explained already, is a much more powerful partner for any negotiations representing 500 million people and a gross national product of 13 trillion euros. No member state can have the same power of negotiation the European Union can mobilize. So what I can do is try to bring in an outsider's perspective uh, in three respects. One is the, the EU's investment stake in kind of global setting. Second, the current trends in, in investment policy making worldwide. And the third, I would like to highlight the challenges for EU in investment policy making, both at the national and international levels, in this new setting, so to speak. Um, I have three messages I wish to put up front right away. First is that the EU has a significant stake in global investment and the global investment relationship. Collectively, it counts for 25% of global investment outward stock and 18% of global investment inward stock and accounts for two-fifths of the total international investment treaties. Share of the EU um, into the world uh, foreign direct investment outflows, you can see here clearly that the European Union is indeed the biggest investor in the world and we have already a very strong investment intra-EU, I think that is also important to highlight because that's also thanks to the single market that our companies can uh, uh, invest within the European Union uh, at, at a higher space. Uh, so uh, the second one is with the United States, Japan, Russia, China, and when we hear again and again in every newspaper that China and China and China again is investing, 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 the figures are here, it is not that impressive compared to what the European Union and the United States are doing. Uh, in 1999, we bought the main oil and gas company in Argentina, YPF. We paid in that time $15 billion in cash for the company. We've been operating the company since then, and we think that we have been a very good corporate citizen in Argentina. We have 
being the main taxpayer, we have more than doubled the workforce in the country. In April 16th, the president of Argentina, Mrs. Fernandez de Kirchner, announced that she was sending to Congress an expropriation law, but of a very special sort. Only YPF was expropriated, and only 51% of the shares from one single shareholder, which was Repsol. Only Repsol was expropriated <coughs> in this moment, and with no compensation at all. Being at the European Parliament, I'm very happy to read in the resolution of 6th of April 2011, that has already been mentioned by Ms. koch -Marin, that also the European Parliament, quote, stresses that investor protection for all EU investors must remain the first priority, quote, the first priority of investment agreements. And it quite rightly points out that future EU policy shall, quote, draw on the best practices of BITs. I have to pinpoint a few minor details in the resolution which seem a bit surprising. First of all, this resolution is pretty vague and at times reads slightly contradictory about what it understands by investment. There are repeated calls to define it clearly. Calls go to the Commission and to the Council but there is no definition proposed. Instead, other concepts are introduced which are, to the reader at first glance, not entirely self-explanatory. 